Good morning, everyone. Uh, my, my topic this morning is the gold standard versus, the, um, versus fiat money. And what I, I propose to do is to show you how the, a sound money, a commodity money, a, a money supplied by the market, was uh, transformed step by step by government actions into uh, a fiat money whose supply and value is completely subject to, to the arbitrary whims of, of politicians. So let's, let's start with a spectrum, a spectrum of international monetary systems. If you'll note, all, um, all the way on the left, you have the best systems. Money came into existence as 100% either silver or gold standard. Okay? We know that, that money developed from barter as a useful good or services that was previously exchanged in barter. The, the actual goal, uh, uh, now governments began inter intervening uh, and taking over uh, some of the f uh, functions of money or, or some of the operations that involve money by the Middle Ages and, and certainly even before then. And so that by the 19th century, though we had a sound money and though you could still say that it was a market supplied money, it was, there was, there was a number of, of different government interventions into the system. But this is the, the standard that I propose to talk about, the classical gold standard. And step by step, this standard was transformed, as I mentioned, into a, a standard which we have today, which is um, right here, uh, false gold standards. Okay, they, they, they were part of the um, expression of government power. But by 1971, even the false gold standards were gone. We'll, we'll go through that. And we had... Um, now we have either freely floating exchange rates, which is not really the case. What we have is really dirty floating, where there are different national fiat currencies that are produced by different central banks, and they fluctuate in value against one another, although the government intervenes to, um, to, to hamper the, 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 the changes in value against one another. That is, they, some countries, for example, China wants to keep their uh, th their currency artificially cheap. Uh, other countries may want to um, hold the value of their, their currency high. So it's called dirty floating or managed floating. So we'll, we'll talk about the uh, various stages of the transformation. Okay, so what was the classical gold standard? What were its main characteristics? As I said, government was involved. There were, there were central banks uh, during the era of the classical gold standard though the U.S. did not have one. So it's basically, first of all, the monetary unit is defined as a weight of gold. Okay. Go, so, so therefore, gold and nothing else is money. The banknotes and deposits that are issued are converted or redeemed at face value. Okay. So if you, have, um, a ten, uh, if you have a $20 bill during the classical gold standard, in the 19th century, you could go to any branch of the treasury or you go to a bank, and in exchange, you would get about an ounce of gold. Okay. As, we'll, as we'll see in a moment, uh, the value of, of uh, an ounce of gold was defined as uh, about um, 1 20th of an ounce. Okay. Or, or rather, the dollar was defined as 1 20th of an ounce. Um, gold coin is in circulation along with banknotes and deposits. And finally, a central bank may or may not exist. It did exist in most um, uh, industrialized countries or industrializing countries during the 19th century, but it did not exist in the US. The money unit, uh, un under the gold standard, the currency name is simply the name for a particular weight of gold. So in the US, for 100 years, from 1834 to 1933, um, gold or the dollar was legally defined as approximately 1 20th of an ounce of gold, or 23.22 grains of gold. And in uh, Great Britain, for over 100 years, the pound was legally defined as uh, equal to about a quarter of an ounce of gold, okay, which is about 113 grains of gold. French franc was defined as about a 100th of an ounce of gold, and so on. Okay. So the money unit, again, is a certain weight of gold. All countries are on the gold standard. Pounds, dollars, francs are just different names for different weights of gold. Okay. 
They are all gold money. So here are $20 and $5 gold coins from 1921 and 1906, respectively. They don't look much different from the British sovereigns uh, uh, that existed, again, in 1894 and, and, and 1931. You could go with, 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 Amer with, with uh, for example, American gold coins. You could go to Britain, and you could purchase things in Britain if you were a tourist. Uh, to the extent that they had confidence in the stamp on, on the U.S. gold coin, they would accept them by weight. So in the 19th century, you could, not only did you not need a passport to go to travel anywhere in, in, in Europe except for, for Russia uh, and the United States, but you just needed to bring gold or silver with you. You could have your own country's coins, and they would be accepted as money. So there was one money, and uh, there was you know, free movement of, of, of people. And they, they went together. I mean, this is really the, the, the glory of classical liberalism. What about exchange rates? Are there exchange rates under the gold standard? So if two cows are traded for one horse, we say there's an exchange rate between these two different goods. Two to one, okay. that, that's the exchange rate. Or one half, of a ho one half of a horse for a cow, that's the exchange rate. That's simply the reciprocal. But is that true under the gold standard? For example, it, it, it's been said that for that 100 years, since there were, was about five times the amount of gold in a, in, a, in a British pound as it was an American dollar, that there was a fixed exchange rate. It was approximately $4, or it was $4.86, plus or minus 1%. Okay. But this is not an exchange rate in the economic sense of the word. Okay. This, an exchange rate always refers to a ratio between two different goods. But the pound and the dollar are part of the same good. For example, it's as if I said there's an exchange rate between the U.S. nickel and the U.S. quarter. Okay, that five nickels purchase one quarter. But that's, that's, not, that's not an exchange rate. It's simply a law of arithmetic, because a nickel is defined as 1 20th of a dollar, a quarter is defined as 1 quarter of a dollar. So there was five times the amount of a dollar represented by a quarter as there is by a, by a nickel. Okay. So that's very important. It's not a system of fixed exchange rates. No one's doing the fixing. It's just simply one money. And I emphasize that here, okay? Now let's talk a little bit about paper currency under the gold standard. Okay. The, the bank deposits and, 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 and the currency notes that were issued under the gold standard by private banks or by the central bank were not in and of themselves money proper. Okay. They were simply money substitutes. They were claims to gold Okay, that were, or, or warehouse receipts for gold that was being stored either by the bank or by the treasury that circulated in lieu of the actual gold coins for reasons of security, convenience, and so on. So when, when you accepted, uh, let's say, a, a currency note, what you were accepting was title or claim to a, a, a gold coin stored some, at some specific place. So you were trading titles to things, okay? Think of the claim checks you receive when you drop off your, your, your um, shirts or, or, or dresses at, at a dry cleaner, okay? The, the claim itself only has value to the extent that it, it refers to an underlying good or service. Same thing is true with, you know, a coat check and so on. Or if, you, let's say, you're a, you um, grew up like me among people in New Jersey who like to race cars and uh, drag race informally on, on public roads late at night, uh, they would race for pink slips. So they would, in other words, give the pink slip to the winner. Pink slip being the title to the car, okay? But the, obviously that was not the value. That's not what they expected. They expected the car, okay, to which that, that pink slip, okay, was, was, was a claim. Okay, so just to give you some examples here, Note now, uh, until the 1920s, private banks could not only issue deposits, checking deposit money, they could also issue currency notes. Eventually, the government put heavy taxes on them, as we'll see, during World War I, the U.S. government, and then, and then banned them outright in the 1920s. But 
For example, here's a, a claim for $20 from 1903. This is not the money itself. This is a money substitute. Notice what it says. The Farmers and Merchants Bank of Los Angeles will pay to the bearer on demand $20. That's not the $20. You're gonna, it's a promise to pay $20. What is the $20? The $20 are the gold coins. Okay, in this case, a one ounce of gold. Another example, the First National Bank of Fort Myers will pay to the bearer on demand $5. That's not the dollar. That, that, those, those aren't the dollars. Okay. Even the U.S. Treasury couldn't circulate its money without it, or couldn't circulate its notes, excuse me, it's not money, without uh, having a, a claim uh, or evidence that it was a claim to gold. So the United States, um, $100 in gold coin repayable to the bearer on demand. Okay, so you, 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 you deposited the gold coin, and in exchange you got the um, U.S. Uh, gold, what's called a gold certificate. Okay, it's a right to claim the gold. Okay, so, so that's, that, that's an idea of, of the, the basics of the, of the gold, classical gold standard. Um, and it's important to realize it did not involve price fixing. Uh, Chicago economists, uh, the followers of Milton Friedman, the monetarists, often say that, well, gold is, uh, we don't understand why f uh, some free market economists, i.e. the Austrians, support a gold standard. Because a gold standard is simply a price fixing scheme on a, on a, a very grand scale. That is, the government is fixing the price of gold by being willing to buy um, gold at $35 an ounce. But, we, but, but as Austrians, we reply, of course, that's not, that's not the case. It's not a, a price-fixing scheme. Okay? What the government is doing in paying out $35 in gold or before 19, um, 1946, under the gold standard, it was $20 in gold. In, in paying out an ounce of gold for $20, it was fulfilling its contract. Okay. It wasn't fixing a price. So in other words, you had to sell gold uh, for dollars freely in order to keep the price fixed. Okay, just as if you, if you want to keep the price of wheat fixed at $5, the government has to sell from, from, from its wheat, st wheat stock all the wheat that people want to buy at a price of $5, and vice versa. It has to buy up all the wheat people present to it at $5. That is a price-fixing scheme. This is not a price-fixing scheme. Okay. This is simply fulfilling the contract. And, of course, in the long run, once you have a gold standard, then the, amount, the, the money supply is strictly limited not day by day, but certainly in the, the short to intermediate run, it's strictly limited by the amount of gold flowing into the, into the country uh, from, from gold mines or through the balance of payments. So the gold standard was often called golden handcuffs. There were handcuffs on government that prevented it from arbitrarily manipulating the money supply. Now, as a result, because the, the supply of money in the 19th century grew very, very slowly um, compared to how the supply of goods was, were growing, uh, or, or was growing, uh, you had a situation where prices tended to fall under the gold standard, especially after the Civil War when the U.S. was industrializing. So um, prices tended to fall over time because people new technology was coming in, people were saving more, and uh, we had, as a result, more funds for investment, which then took advantage of these new technological projects, and we, that resulted in an increase in productivity of labor. So real goods and services were increasing much more quickly than was the money supply. And as a result, we have what I call a growth deflation. Okay. So you, probably if you've taken uh, principles of economics or, or, or intermediate macroeconomics, you've been told that in order to have growth, you have to have inflation. That inflation and growth go together. As the price level rises, um, growth, growth will, will increase. Or if you have growth, um, to support that growth, you have to have an increase in the money supply that at least keeps prices stable, if not ri raises them. But of course, if you look on any market, if you look on markets today, you'll see that in those industries which are growing the fastest, prices are falling. 
So LASIK eye surgery, for example, where you get new technological in innovations coming in. Uh, it used to be $3,000 per eye in the late 1990s, uh, and now it's $300 per eye. Uh, if you look at cosmetic surgery, okay, that is surgery that is elective surgery that, that is not covered by insurance or by government Medicare, uh, prices are going down because there's new technology and, and, and lowering of costs and, and prices are following. So in those industry, uh, HDTVs and, 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 and tablet computers and so on, they have their prices falling because those are industries in which the supplies of goods and services are increasing more rapidly than the increase in the money supply. That's the natural tendency of a free market capitalist economy. It's for prices to continually fall. Okay. That's exactly what happened between 1880 um, and uh, 1896 when there were new, new gold discoveries and more gold came into the market. But prices fell by about 2 or 3% in the United States during that period. And that was the most rapid period of growth in the United States. The 1880s was the, 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 the highest um, uh, rate of decadal growth, that is, the decade which, in which the, the decade in which the economy grew the most in American history. Okay. And that was during a period of falling prices. So actually, I have some figures up here for you. Um, from 1880 to 1896, you had a fall in prices of about 30 percent. Prices were 30 percent lower 16 years later. Uh, and that meant that prices were falling by about one and three quarters percent per year. But at the same time, GDP, real GDP, went up by 85 percent or five percent per year. Extremely rapid growth by today's standards. Even when the U.S. economy was doing well in the 1950s and 60s and into the early 70s, we were growing at no more than three percent per year. But to have sustained growth of five percent per year is, is amazing. And there you see a picture of what happened during the 19th century. So from 1809, uh, from 1812 to 1815, we had a war with, uh, the War of 1812 with the British. Murray Rothbard once said that um, America and, and Great Britain were uh, on, on the wrong sides of every war they fought, except for the American Revolution and, and the War of 1812. He said, well, the American Revolution, the Americans were right, on the right side, and in the War of 1812, the British were on the right side. Um, so, but in any case, we also had the first bank of the US, which was printing money. So you see that big blip in, in, in the price level there uh, before 1820, okay, that resulted eventually in the Panic of 1819. Okay, that was a result of, of paper money. Once the bank was, was um, not rechartered, once Jefferson won his war against the bank, Prices fell again as we went back to a gold standard. Um, and then, once again, you'll see that big blip there in the 19th century. That, well, that's obviously the, the paper money, the greenbacks that were printed to pay for the Civil War. Okay? But once those greenbacks were retired okay. and, and we went back to the classical gold standard, we had a fall in the price level, continual fall. Okay? Prices rose very slowly from 1896 to 1914 in the U.S. People called it a great inflation. The reason why was because there was, a, there was a, a, a new gold sources found in the Yukon and found in, in South Africa, and, and, and so the gold was coming into the U.S. But what they called the great inflation was a 13% inflation. That is, prices rose by 13% over, uh, between 1896 in 1914. That's less than 1% per year. In today's terminology, that's deflation. We, we can't have any prices falling, uh, rising by less than 2% per year, otherwise we're going to get a deflation, okay? And all its so-called uh, so horrible, you know, effects and consequences. So let me just talk about the boom and bust. There were booms and busts during the classical gold standard because there, wa there, there was a fractional reserve banking. Um, but fractional reserve banks could only really temporarily increase the money supply, okay? because they would begin to lose gold as prices rose. People began to purchase more imported goods, which were, which were cheaper, and um, were discouraged from purchasing domestic goods, so gold flowed out of the country 
Okay? But for a period, as, as the fractional reserve banks were increasing the money supply, you did get lower interest rates, you got inflation of prices, and you got many bad loans and investments and bad production processes. Okay. So you, did, you, you would have periods of false prosperity. So we had the panic of 1819, though that was a paper money panic, but we, but we had uh, 1857 uh, uh, in 1873, um, and then in the 1890s, 1907. But that, that wasn't due to the, cl the classical gold standard per se, but to the fact that there was fractional reserve banking, so money became a loose joint. To some extent, the money supply could be increased by fractional reserve banks by lowering the ratio of reserves that they were holding. But it would inevitably end in a recession or bust, and you had many businesses and banks going out of business, which was a good thing for the banks, because then they would wait a while before they began inflating the money supply again. Okay? They would have learned their lesson. Um, but, but because in the 19th century the government didn't interfere in labor markets, prices would fall very rapidly. Uh, businesses would know that they were not going to get bailed out, so wage, wages would fall, prices would fall, um, and they would reestablish themselves at a level that was adjusted to the money supply. And you'd get the profit margins opening up again, and eventually uh, we would get production restarted, and we, we'd get more hiring, and we'd come out of the recession fairly, very quickly. The last good recession or depression we had was in 1920-21, when there was a, uh, an immense fall, in, uh, uh, tremendous fall in prices, um, but it only lasted um, about nine months, and then we, 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 we returned to normalcy, as uh, I guess it was President Coolidge said. But these, these business cycles were minor compared to what occurred after, after the, 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 the um, central banks began to try to stabilize the price system and began to manipulate the money supply and interest rates. That really began after World War I or really at the beginning of, of World War I, all governments went off the gold standard. Within two weeks of the outbreak of, of World War I, all belligerents went off the gold standard because gold would have restrained their military spending. I mean, remember in, in, in the Middle Ages, under the, during the age, or late Middle Ages, during the age of, of, of royal absolutism, um, armies would, 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 would stop fighting because they weren't being paid. And they would just go home, and sometimes they would kill a king, which would be a good thing. Um, <laughs> because they, they, they couldn't come up with the funds under a gold standard to, to, pay, to pay for these, these various military expenditures. OK. Now, there's a, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, there's a, something called the balance of payments adjustment mechanism, which was a mechanism which restrained the central bank or, or the fractional reserve banks from perpetrating a really big inflation. So under the gold standard, it was, it was really an automatic mechanism, I'd rather call it, I don't like the word automatic, but it was a spontaneous process, let's say, in, in which all in individuals were involved, all individual buyers and sellers and so on. So what would happen? Let's say, the cent let's say it's, it's, it's a Great Britain, you have the Bank of England, uh, so they would uh, um, increase their um, uh, notes, uh, and the notes then would, would, would be uh, the reserves, and I'll show you a picture of this in a moment, for, for the banks. The banks would have more reserves. They'd have the Bank of England notes, and they would therefore loan out more. And so you'd get an increase in the money supply. British prices would go up above world prices. Okay? And, and th there's, a, there's the immediate beginning of the reaction against the increase in the money supply that you get under the gold standard. Because once that happened, you would have people buying less of the domestic goods, British subjects buying fewer domestic goods, and buying more uh, goods from the rest of the world, which is also on the gold standard, and where prices would be lower. So imports would go up, exports would decrease. How are you to pay for the extra exports? There would be a balance of payments deficit. You'd be buying more abroad and owing more, more money abroad than you would, um, than, than would be, be um, purchased from, from, from your, your economy. And so gold would then flow out to foreign countries. The foreign countries didn't want your bank notes, they, even if they were from, the, from, from the, uh, the central bank. What they wanted was gold. So banks, central banks, and, and private banks would begin losing gold. And as they fell, people would see the gold flowing out of their banks, and they begin to get worried. 
and there would be either actual bank runs or the threat, the imminent threat of bank runs. And that would be enough to stop the inflation. So banks would then try to reduce the amount of notes and deposits they had in circulation. Uh, they would stop, reduce their lending, and the domestic money supply would fall back. And as it did, prices would fall back to world levels. The balance of payments would go back to um, being basically in equilibrium, and gold would, could, would not continue to flow out of the country. In fact, prices would tend to fall even uh, below what world prices were, and um, if they contracted the money supply enough, and then gold would flow in, because your economy would have lower prices than the rest of the world. So you'd export more. Okay. And once that happened, though, you would get a recession. As we, as we talked about. But again, it, it would be a recession that would get over very, very quickly because the government, for the most part, and the central bank also, did not intervene. Okay. Now, here's an example of what's called the money pyramid, um, which existed under the gold standard. So note the very bottom. Well, let's say a, a central bank had in its coffers $2 billion in gold. And let's say they, they um, by law or by the fact that they were prudent, wanted to keep 40% reserves okay, of gold against the notes they issue. So the central bank then could, now ignore the, the, uh, the, the, the red, the figures in red font, please, uh, and just look at the black font. Okay, so if the reserve ratio was 40%, well then, $2 billion would be 40% of $5 billion. So, so the central bank would be able to issue $5 billion worth of notes. Those notes would then become the reserves for the commercial banks, which also were able to issue their own notes and deposits. So they would hold, let's say their reserve ratio was 20%. So if there were $5 billion of notes from the central bank at, that they were holding as reserves, they could then issue five times as many uh, notes and deposits. So let's say the total money supply was $25 billion. Okay. Uh, and let's say that the central bank suddenly started to inflate the money supply. Let's say they um, increased the, their note issue by $1 billion. They went from $5 billion to $6 billion. So their reserve ratio would fall. Now they would only be holding about a third, uh, uh, or a third of their notes would be backed by gold. But those notes would get into circulation, they would be deposited in the banks, which would then hold them as reserves, and as a result, they would have now a billion more dollars in reserves to loan out. Under fractional reserve banking, if it's a 20% reserve ratio, that could be multiplied fivefold. So the money supply would, would increase by $5 billion. So now you would have the money supply increasing from $25 billion to, to, to um, $30 billion, which is a 20% increase in the money supply. You can imagine prices would shoot up above world prices, and what would happen? You would get that balance of payments adjustment mechanism. Because prices were so high in your country and it was a bad place to, to buy and a good place to sell, you'd be getting a lot of imports, very, you'd, be, you'd be having very few exports, and gold would flow out of the country. Okay? And as gold flowed out, remember now, there's $25, $30 billion out there that is a claim on, ultimately, $2 billion worth of gold. So not only was gold flowing out, not only do we have what's called an ex external trade of gold to foreign countries, people would start getting worried and would start turning in their, 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 their checking deposit, or withdrawing money from their checking deposits or turning in their notes in exchange for gold. So go there would be an internal drain of gold. So that gold stock would start shrinking. And at that point, the central bank would immediately pull in the reins and reduce the money supply. And that would reverse the process and the gold would flow back in. Now, where did the, the destruction of sound money begin? It began with World War I, okay? And actually, before World War I, um, when President Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act right before Christmas of 1913, establishing a, a bank, the, the Federal Reserve Bank, which was the central bank of the United States. It was supposed to be decentralized. There were 12 different districts, 12 different um, uh, reserve banks. And, uh, but, but it really was eventually controlled from Washington. Okay? Initially, it was, uh, New York was the dominant bank. Okay. So 
What was the result? Uh, well, to, to begin with, the classical gold standard existed, the, existed from about 1834 to 1933 in the U.S., sort of, okay? It really didn't exist after World War I, but there were still some remnants of it that did constrain government. But during World War I, now that you had the Fed, the gold reserves were centralized in the Fed. It became law. All banks had to hold gold, their gold reserves, in the central bank. Uh, and they then had to hold the Federal Reserve notes. And that got people accustomed to cashing in their, where they deposited a check or, or a note, they would get not the gold, but another note in, uh, in return. So, that, so you, you turned in you know, a $10 note from your bank, or if you withdrew $10 from your, your checking account at your bank, they would give you Federal Reserve notes. Now, you could insist on gold. Okay. But that was considered, to, there was a propaganda campaign against gold that this is uh, an old-fashioned way of, of doing things. No one carries gold around their pockets. It's, uh, it's, it's inconvenient, unsafe, and so on. All right. So Americans became accustomed with that centralization of gold reserves to central bank money as dollars. Okay. People began to think as, of gold as backing dollars, and dollars being the um, Fed, Federal Reserve note or the Treasury note. Okay. Uh, heavy tax was placed on the private issue of banknotes, so they were trying to stamp out the private issue of banknotes so that people would be more focused on, on, on the, the central banknote as, as the money. Okay. And the export of gold was prohibited for a while in 1917. You couldn't send gold abroad to pay your debts. In the 1920s, they, 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 as I said, they instituted an outright ban of banknotes. Okay, they were outlawed. So, so no, uh, of private banknotes. No private bank could issue banknotes any longer. So now if you wanted to carry around banknotes, they would be the Federal Reserve notes. So people were, were totally accustomed to those notes as the dollar. They could still demand their gold, but the, the um, propaganda campaign against gold continued during that period. Uh, and then during, uh, during World War I, the Fed cut reserve requirements in half meaning banks did not have to hold around 20% against their um, deposits and notes. They could now hold around 10% or even less. And as a result, the money supply doubled from 1913 to 1919. Okay, it wasn't just as a result of, of that, but also uh, the, 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 there was a money being lent to banks and so on. But we had a doubling of the money supply, which caused a huge inflation and then uh, the, the, the Fed in 1919, 1920 began to restrain the increase in the money supply, and that's where we got the, the, what was called the Depression of 1920-21, okay, which ended very, very quickly because uh, the government did not intervene. The central bank did not try to uh, begin to reinflate the money supply until 1922 when it was already over. So uh, how, uh, the, this, uh, to continue with the destruction of the classical gold standard, the Fed expanded reserves during the 1920s both to stabilize prices and to bail out Great Britain. Great Britain tried to reestablish itself as a center of finance after World War I. And in order to do so, they had to reestablish the pound, uh, its parity with gold. Okay? The pound had depreciated in value. It took a lot more pounds to buy an ounce of gold after the war than before the war, because they had gone off the gold standard, printed a lot of pounds, and the price of gold went up. So let's say the price of gold went up to seven or eight dollars, uh, seven or eight pounds. They wanted to, uh, uh, let's see, what was, it, what was the ratio? Um, not seven or eight pounds, but uh, it's five dollars. So let's say it was about a pound for gold. So let's say it went up to two, dollars, two pounds per, per gold. They wanted to, 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 to reduce it, okay? They wanted to reduce it back to what the price was um, before World War I, okay? which means that they had to deflate the economy because their prices were very high. Prices had gone up during World War I, and they, they were very high. So the U.S. helped them avoid deflating by raising our own prices okay? so that with our prices going higher now, it would be easier for, for Great Britain to export to us and, 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 to, and to get gold uh, to back up their, uh, the pound. 
not only to get gold, but to stop the outflow of gold from Great Britain to the rest of the world. Because with their high prices, no one was buying anything from Great Britain. Everybody wanted to sell to them. So they had a lot of exports, very few imports. So we tried to raise pri the prices sort of to, to allow them to, to return to the gold standard. Uh, and then um, the, we had the Great Depression. As a result of this big increase in the money supply, which Murray Rothbard estimated about 7% per year from 1922, from the end of 1921 to, to, through 1928. That was a, 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 a huge increase in, 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 um, in, in the uh, money supply. But what happened was uh, we, American economists claimed there was no inflation in the United States. Irving Fisher, who Gary North referred to, Dr. North referred to um, yesterday, uh, said that we have reached an era of perpetual prosperity. We will never have another depression because now we know how to control um, the prices. That is, we have stabilized prices. So even though the, the, um, the, uh, even though we had a, tr uh, a tremendous increase in the money supply, we had tremendous technological advance and more saving and investment during the, the 1920s. We had refrigeration, radios coming in and so on. And so there was a plethora of goods, that a uh, cornucopia of, 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 of new goods that were coming onto the market. And as a result, even though the money supply was increasing, it stopped, prices did not rise. Prices should have been falling when you had that much economic growth. Okay. But when the, the Fed in 1920, we, we, did, we did see symptoms of the inflation, symptoms of, of this money growth. As uh, We had a real estate boom, of, and of course we had a stock market boom. And when the Fed stopped inflating at the end of 1928, we got the usual um, sequence of events. Interest rates shot up. Businesses saw suddenly they made uh, bad investments, malinvestments, and they began to cut back on the workforce, and we went into recession. Okay. And it wasn't helped by the fact that, that we had a collapse of the stock market. Stock market values fell by about 90%. Okay. So uh, banks began to collapse in, in 1930 uh, and, until 1933. Uh, we had a run on the banks. Um, as, as some banks collapsed, even the ones that were more stable uh, b began to uh, raise doubts. Okay, people people lost confidence in, in the bank system as a whole, and so they rushed to to to, to withdraw their 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 funds from their savings accounts and and uh, checking accounts. And since the banks were fractional reserve banks, they couldn't pay off. So these savings accounts and and checking accounts, many of them disappeared into thin air. Okay, so the money supply sh shrank tremendously. So to prevent this. Um, there was a bank holiday declared by uh, President uh, Roosevelt in, in um, March. The banks were closed for four or five days. And then when the banks were reopened, uh, there was uh, uh, an, uh, an attempt to encourage people to trust the banks again by instituting a federal deposit insurance. Uh, finally, uh, a few months later in May, the ownership of gold was prohibited, and gold was devalued from $20 to $35. Okay. So it lost some of its value in terms of dollars. Here is the executive order, uh, which reads, um, on or before May 1st, all gold coin, gold bullion, and gold certificates now owned by them to, now owned by them to uh, a Federal Reserve Bank branch or agency or to any member bank of the Federal Reserve System. Okay, so it says all persons are required to deliver, excuse me, on or before May 1st. So it was against the law to, to own gold any longer after May 1st. And then um, it, was, it had really, the, the law had teeth because it said criminal penalties for violation of executive order, $10,000 fines or 10 years in prison or both as provided by Section 9 of this order. Okay. So only licensed jewelers and licensed uh, dentists were permitted to own gold or, or other uh, um, businesses that, that, that acquired licenses for gold. And we, we never got the right back to own gold again until 1975. I think that there was a law passed in 74 that allowed Americans to, to own gold again. I think it went into effect in 75. And uh, 
you'll see here the statement by FDR. In politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. Okay, so it was planned to, I mean, we're not saying there's a conspiracy against the gold standard, but the gold standard shackled the government's hands. It didn't let them spend, okay? It didn't let them spend in excess of, of tax revenues and of what they could borrow on, on, on the free market, okay? So in order to loosen those shackles or to get to destroy those shackles, the gold standard was destroyed step by step. Uh, it was, there was an attempt, I don't want to take too much time here because I don't have much time. There was an attempt to restore that um, after World War II, to restore a gold standard because it was chaos uh, after the gold standard had collapsed in the 1930s. Uh, monetary chaos, international investment, international trade almost came to an end. Um, and there was what was called currency wars, where each country would try to print more money and drive the value of its own money down so they could sell more to other countries, but other countries would respond by doing the exact same thing. So we had, had mass inflation. So who were the main architects of the Bretton Woods system, which again is, was a, a false um, uh, gold standard? Uh, both the, British the U.S. and the British governments, okay? And their leading financial uh, experts were Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes. White was the Treasury representative, Keynes was the representative of the British government. Uh, White had a, they both more, more or less wanted uh, eventually uh, a world money or at least a world reserve currency. Uh, White called it UNITA or UNITA um, for United World, uh, Bancor for bank gold, okay, uh, was Keynes' uh, word, okay. So he wanted that, that to be um, issued as reserves so that all countries could inflate together so that no country lost gold to another country, okay, which was the, under the gold standard, there was no coordination. Bank, banks would inflate in one country and gold would flow out to other countries. And that, that, that was a, a virtue of the gold standard. But since Keynes was in fl favor of inflation, uh, he wanted um, to replace it. Uh, here, here's Bretton Woods, they met, it's in New Hampshire. They met at this uh, great grand hotel, okay, and we had a conference up there, the Mises Institute had a conference up there a few years ago. Uh, it's been renovated, it's really beautiful. There's Keynes and, and Harry Dexter White. White, it was later proven, was a, a Soviet spy. He, was te he te testified before the House Un-American Un Activities Committee, and, and almost all historians left and right now agree that he passed state secret information to the Soviet Union during World War II. Uh, in fact, um, when the Soviets, uh, when Russia opened the archives after the fall of the USSR, they found documents that proved that he was a Soviet spy. Uh, and according to Ben Stahl, who wrote a book on the Bretton Woods system, um, White was not a member of, of, of the uh, uh, Communist Party, uh, but he acted not simply because he believed that the Soviet Union was a vital U.S. ally, but because he also believed passionately in the success of the bold Soviet experiment with socialism. Well, Hitler's experiment was pretty bold, right? But if you were ever to say that, I mean, you, you know, your, your reputation would be immediately blackened, okay? But people could talk about the bold Soviet experiment uh, in the 30s, 40s. Okay. Um, what was the characteristics of this? Well, I don't want to go through too much, but basically it was based on the U.S. dollar. Only the U.S. dollar was convertible into gold at the price of $35 per ounce, but you and I, or our parents, and, or rather our grandparents and great-grandparents, could not convert their dollars into gold. That was only, um, the U.S. would only convert dollars into gold for other countries, okay, other official institutions, uh, governments and central banks. Okay, and I basically say that there. Okay, the other currencies were not backed by gold, but were backed by U.S. dollars. Um, and they were all pyramided on, on top of, of U.S. gold stock. So now when the Fed created money, we didn't have to worry about our balance of payments deficit because we'd create more dollars, prices would go up, we'd buy things from the rest of the world, but they would accept our dollars. So we got real goods and services during the late 50s and, and, and 1960s in exchange for paper money that was depreciating. Now initially, um, I don't want to look at that. Everyone trusted the dollar to be as good as gold, okay? 
By the way, the French economist Jacques Ureff called this the deficit without tears, meaning that the U.S. could just go on and have trade deficits with the, or balance of payments deficits with the rest of the world by just printing up this paper because the rest of the world was willing to accept and hold the dollars or dollar assets to back up their own money. So we created, we, we ex, what we exported to Europe was inflation. What they exported to us were real goods and services. Okay, let me just show you. Um, so basically, Europeans paid for the uh, Vietnam War. President Johnson said, we can have guns and butter. We can have consumer goods and we can have military um, equipment and weapons and so on. Um, and uh, so uh, he, he instituted uh, social welfare programs that were very expensive. We were fighting the Vietnam War that was very expensive. But taxes didn't go up a lot in the United States. Consumer living standards pretty much stayed the same, despite these very expensive um, uh, programs, government programs. Okay. And that was because we had a massive balance of payments deficit with Europe. They were sending us real goods and services. We were sending this paper. Why did they accept our paper? Because initially they thought the US dollar was as good as gold. Uh, in 1950, we, we owned more than half the world's gold stock, uh, valued, at 20, uh, valued at $35 per ounce. We had $25 billion worth. Foreign liabilities were, were only 12. That is, foreign governments held about $12 billion. So there was more than 100% of backing, so they weren't worried. As we began to have these expensive programs, um, we, we, we began to accumulate all these dollars that we were, were spending, uh, began to accumulate abroad, it went way up, so that by 1968, we had $10 million, a billion dollars worth of gold, and there were $60 billion of foreign liabilities, dollar liabilities, that we owed gold for. And we had to get rid of the gold cover, uh, the, the reserve requirement for the Fed to hold 25% gold uh, b behind their um, the, the deposits. Banks deposited money with the Fed. Also, by 1968, they had to re release, uh, get rid of 25% uh, gold cover on the Fed notes. There used to be gold. It wasn't backing the notes. You couldn't actually get the gold out. But they were holding 25% of the value of notes in the form of gold. In, so uh, everything began to collapse. Once, once foreign countries, especially Switzerland, Germany, France, saw that we had, um, that the U.S. gold stock had run very low, and we had, what we were doing was we were selling gold because the price of gold kept going up over 35%, uh, over $35 per ounce, in, in free gold markets in Zurich and London. So the U.S. had to continue to give gold to foreign governments so that they could sell the gold on these markets to keep the price at $35 per ounce. Finally, in 71, um, Germany left the uh, Bretton Woods system. They weren't willing to keep accepting these depreciating dollars and inflating on top of them. Uh, Switzerland uh, redeemed $50 million in gold in July, and um, France sent an actual naval ship to uh, New York Harbor to pick up $131 billion million worth of gold that was owed by the U.S. Uh, of course, you know, they didn't really want any, any sort of a, an accident where a U.S. Coast Guard cutter might bump, if they sent a commercial ship, might bump the ship and sink it or something like that. That's why they sent a warship. That's how trusted the U.S. was at that point. Okay. And this is the uh, French ship. <laughs> it's called the Louis Wune. Uh, no, actually, okay, so they weren't fooling around. Okay. And Nixon closed the gold window. So right after France picked up its gold in early August, on August 15th, Nixon went on television, slammed the gold window shut, reneged on the solemn promise we made to the rest of the world, that is our obligation to pay gold out at the rate of $35 per ounce. And he says, I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily, right, the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of the monetary stability and in the best interests of the United States. That's just all nonsense. I mean, what he's doing is saying, we're not paying gold out anymore. Because in another two weeks, we'd have lost all of the gold that we had. So uh, let me stop there. That's just to show you, after 1971, I'll just show you that last diagram. Here's 71. Look what happened to the US price level. Okay? It was going up. Bretton Woods was inflationary. It started to go up uh, from 1950. But then, after we got uh, left, left the, even the false gold standard, which constrained us somewhat, the um, price level rose tremendously. Thank you very much.